Hello, so I hope you can hear me. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy you can hear me. We can now start our session. Um, I welcome everybody to AFRIA's webinar of, on 17th, this day, April 2019. Uh, my name is Sarah Kadu from Uganda. I'm sure many of you have either heard me uh, um, speak or you've at least and know my name through publications, or we've interfaced in one way or another. So it's a good thing to be here again today to welcome, to welcome everybody to this interesting session of the second part of AFRIA's webinar series, uh, particularly on open access publishing. Um, the presentation of today has two parts and two presenters, uh, we are going to, 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 to listen to our two renowned speakers and presenters on two parts, uh, which include open access publishing, an overview by our colleague, Dr. Tony Leliot, and then the second part will be on open access publishers and the role of universities and I'll do introduce the speaker at that point. Um, something that I wish you to take note of is that I've already started receiving certain questions in the chat. So kindly be reminded that we address all other questions at the Q and A box so that we don't miss out any of your questions. Uh, we need to, to direct these questions if that um, to, to the right speakers, if you have certain questions that you want to be directed to a certain speaker, kindly do mention that in the Q and A box. Uh, for instance, you would say, uh, my question goes to Sarah Kadu, so that Sarah Kadu uh, can ably respond to the question. And where we have general questions, then any of the panelists can come in and respond to your questions. Uh, we are going to use one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, hopefully we can uh, take advantage of that. And then later on that time, we'll include the question and answer section. Uh, right now, I wish to introduce Dr. Tony, uh, who is a program specialist. And Dr. Tony Aleliot, has an honorary degree, which is at the professorial level, is an associate professor at the University of Witwatersrand, and is currently involved in peer research project at the CED South Africa. And is also a co-leader of the Open Educational Resources Africa Professional Development Project. So uh, we join me in welcoming Dr. Tony. Dr. Tony, I now hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, start then. Um, I'm just going to enable my video. Um, let's see if that works. Oh, I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. So I don't know if it's possible for the administrator to enable my video. <coughs> but um, if that's not possible, I can just move on anyway. I'll just wait a second in case the administrator wants to do that. Ah, okay. That is the okay. case. It still tells me the host has stopped my video. That's what my message is coming up on my screen. 
So be it. I will. Um, I think we better move to the starting the presentation. No, it's refusing to go. Um, okay, so let's just go to the um, presentation. Okay, so um, if it enables me to do it later on, I will do. Okay, so I'm. Uh, my name is Tony Lelliot. I work, as you heard, for, at um, OER Africa. In fact, the organization I work at is uh, SAIDI, SAIDE, um, and uh, we, have a, we run this initiative called OER Africa, and I'm involved in it, and um, my co-speaker, who will be speaking a little later, is, um, is also involved, um, Liz Levy. I'm starting off then talking about open access publishing. And um, I'm going to give some sort of rationales for it. Uh, what I want to say is that um, the important thing about open access publishing is that once published, the, the, the articles, etc., are available freely to everybody, assuming they have uh, internet access, um, but and they can be distributed without asking for anybody for permission. And as we'll see in a few moments, that's different from the... Uh, from uh, traditional publishing, where the, uh, you do have to ask permission and it's usually quite costly. So that's the first thing about open access publishing. Um, secondly, uh, all these people listed here, researchers, teachers, general public, policymakers, etc., do not have to have a subscription to a particular journal if that journal is an open access journal. They can just access it without the subscription. Um, I'm being asked to start my video, but it still tells me it's been stopped, so I'll just carry on. Um, so that is an, uh, that's one of the features, that uh, you need no subscription in order to, uh, uh, to read articles in open access journals. And I'm getting some funny things going on here. Let's go to the third one. Um, the third one is that it's important to understand that open access is compatible with copyright, with all the things that are tr traditionally there in uh, journal publishing, copyright, peer review, the quality and indexing, all those things that happen in um, normal publishing, open access is compatible with those. And it does have a particular feature and that is, you do not sign away your copyright in open access publishing. Um, okay, so we've, we've already said that they, re, re, they eliminate price barriers, um, they reduce the permission requirements, etc., cetera, um, in, uh, in open access. And there are some studies that demonstrate that open access literature receives more citations than subscription publications. This is in some disciplines. Uh, it's interesting because there are um, some quite wide renowned researchers have more recently started publishing in open access journals just so that their, uh, their research can get out there uh, more easily than it did in the past. So it's quite a recent phenomenon to really um, uh, extend people's uh, citations and extend their um, their work so that it can be read by more people. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, authors retain the rights. You retain copyright. I'm sure many of you know that when uh, an, uh, uh, when a publisher, when you publish in a particular journal, the journal writes to you at some point and asks you to uh, sign over. You have to sign a waiver copyright document. And then after that, they actually have copyright on your, on your article. And uh, there are some ways to share it still, and Liz will be mentioning those a little later on. But um, essentially, you sign away your copyright, whereas in open access journals, that is not the case. You keep your own copyright. Okay, so there are um, three main licensing models I want to talk about. Um, the first one, that is, is the one that is the traditional form. These are fully copyrighted journals. 
I'm sure you know them in your discipline and the discipline of the uh, academics who work in your universities. Uh, fully copyrighted journals. And one, the, the people who pay here are the reader through a subscription, or um, in some cases they raise funds through advertising. Um, the, the extreme other end are the open access journals. Now, in order for these to uh, be able to continue existing, for the open access journals to carry on, they need some form of income. And in this case, the author, the person who's writing the article, does usually have to pay a fee to the journal, but they do retain copyright. So those are open access journals. And thirdly, there are hybrid journals. In fact, some fully copyrighted journals are now introducing a hybrid model, partly as a result of pressure from the open access field. Um, and they, uh, they allow you to um, publish in the copyrighted journal, but you pay a fee and you can have your article in that issue of the journal as an open access article. So we'd say those are hybrid journals and these are actually increasing as a result partly of the open access publishing movement. So I'll just say a little bit about them. Traditional journals then, they make their money through subscriptions and through advertising, as I've mentioned already. Um, and as you being librarians, many of you will know that these are usually, ex the subscriptions are expensive. Um, and quite often, several publishing houses join together and then universities are required to pay a very hefty fee to access a number of different journals in a number of different fields. And those subscriptions are high, but they, uh, the, the journals can, um, can partly make them high because of the quality of the journal. They show that they are very high quality and this feature called impact factor, which I'm sure you're aware of, just briefly, it is the amount that the particular article gets cited. Um, it's a, there's a formula to work it out, and uh, journals with uh, large numbers of citations get higher impact factors. And that is a feature which many universities prefer their academic staff to publish in high impact factor journals. Um, they then also, uh, overall, it is there's an incentive for academics uh, in a way it's it's not a monetary incentive but there is an incentive for um academic staff to uh do peer carry out peer review in these um high impact quality journals and um the the one feature is of course that the the peer review is not actually paid you don't pay for peer review but you can attract top academics to do that peer review. Um, however, as we know, publishers are being criticized for these high fees. They're criticized for expecting peer review to be free and what I've already mentioned again, for requiring authors to sign over all their rights. So, this is happening, I would say, throughout the world, this, these, these three criticisms, and um, traditional journals are having to, to attend to those criticisms. And one of their responses is actually to create the hybrid journal, which I'll mention again in a moment. So open access journals, uh, as we've said, they are free to access with no subscription, but the author does have to pay a fee, and it's usually referred to as an author processing charge. That is in order for the open access journal to be able to survive. Um, what is happening in some parts of the world is that donors will are prepared to pay part or all of that charge. And in some cases, institutions are prepared to do it. Um, in fact, one of the reasons, one of the criticisms of the traditional publishers is that the um, research in some countries 
is funded, fully funded, and yet the fruits, the results of the research are you have to pay for, or the public has to pay for. So the, that criticism is such that the donors, the original donors, are then encouraging people to publish in open access journals, and they are prepared to pay the author processing charge. So that is, uh, covers that one in a way. Um, in increasing numbers of, what, what is, in, is good is that there are increasing numbers not only of hybrid, but also quality open access journals. And I know we're going to get some questions about how do you know what is a quality open access journal? And uh, um, we will be covering that a little later on. So funders, as I've said, are now requiring more researchers to publish open access. Okay, the third type I've mentioned, uh, subscription-based journal publishers allow the publication of an article for an additional fee, an open ac access for, for an author publishing charge. Um, and in that case, unlike the traditional subscription-based journal, the author will retain the rights to their article. So that is one feature that they can retain. But one needs to note that the publisher is making two sets of profit. They're actually making a profit through their subscriptions, but they're also making some profit through the author's um, fee. Okay, so now we're going to cover over a series of slides um, how to determine what a reputable open access journal or publisher looks like. Okay, and there are watchdog organizations. This is relatively recent, but over, the, over, year, over time, we've been um, seeing more and more of these. And we know that the quality of open access journals does vary widely. One of the best things to go to is the directory of open access journals. So I would strongly, if you don't know about it, I just note down that name, directory of open access journals, because they uh, they will give you, uh, they will tell you what, which open access journals are, are, are high quality. And all of those ones use a proper peer review and editorial cont quality control process. All those journals in the DOAJ. Okay, I'm going to be asked to try my camera. I'll tr try it once more. happening yet. <laughs> yeah, stuck at the moment at the top of the screen. Ah, I did see something then. Let's see if I can do it again. Ah, finally, you can see me. Right, thank you. I think it was, uh, it, somehow it wasn't working. Okay, um, so I'm sitting in my office at Sadie in Johannesburg. So finally, towards the end of my presentation, you're actually getting to see me. Okay, um, so uh, I just want to go back because I am now, oh dear, I need to go back to that, back to that. That seems to have messed up my, ah, we are. So um, the final point to mention here is, just want to move my picture, I don't want it on my screen is uh, there's another thing to look at, and that is to determine whether the publisher is a member of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. So that's something else to look at. Okay, another way to look is to look in scholarly databases to find out reputable publishers. And you can look, I'm speeding up a little bit because that's delayed me slightly getting my camera working, but there are lists of um, reputable open access journals. In South Africa, we can access those over the internet and you can look at those at some of the uh, well-known South African university websites, uh, sorry, library websites that will help you. So um, you can search those in the South African Department of Higher Education and Training list and University of Pretoria and other places have them. And, now that's my phone, of course, going. 
Okay, um, open access journals are also included in, in major indices, and I'm sure you're familiar with the web of knowledge and Scopus. So um, those are worth looking at as well. Um, okay, so some of the research communities have their own specialized academic databases that can be used to search. So a particular area like engineering might be able to, might have its own uh, di disciplinary database. And you can get in touch with your staff and check the open access journals that are abstracted in such uh, databases. And there's another way of doing the final way, my final slide, and I'm going to be handing over to Liz Levy now. Um, you can check whether a journal is archived, because if, if a journal is archived, it's going to be preserved for future use. And the publisher's policies on archiving are quite confusing, but they, uh, the, it's well worth looking up this, uh, this organization, this directory called Sherpa Romeo. And their directory lays out exactly how the, um, you, can, you can archive, you can self-archive, and other forms of archiving. And I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Liz Levy, and she's going to take through through the remainder of the presentation. So I'm going to stop my video. So bye for now. I'll answer questions later. Uh, I'm also going to so my microphone uh, and let Liz start. Oh. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tony. Um, as I did mention at the beginning, we have two parts of this presentation, and I'm sure we've enjoyed the first part of the presentations. And at his concluding remarks, Dr. Tony reminded us to, to submit all the questions later on when Liz has completed her presentation as well. Um, the second part of the presentation, maybe for the benefit of those who came in slightly after we had started, the first part of the presentation uh, was on open access and publishing, and Dr. Tony was giving an overview of that part. Now, the second part uh, is on open access publishers and the role of universities. Uh, so uh, this is going to be are presented by Lisbeth Levy. Uh, we, we normally refer to Lisbeth as Liz. Uh, Liz is a sweet name, a short name of Lisbeth. So uh, I wish to introduce Liz at this point. Uh, Liz is a consultant on information and communication technology in Africa. And particularly, her uh, uh, area of focus is on improving access and enhancing this, uh, enhancing and disseminating information on the African continent, and particularly uh, on open access. So there are no better presenters than the two we have this afternoon or today. Uh, I welcome Liz to take us through the second part of the presentation. Please, you are welcome. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going to pick up from where uh, Tony left off. I've included a screen capture from the archiving policy um, of Sherpa Romeo, and this is the policy that most organizations use now. Um, you can see that if a journal is has green, it means that the author is free to um, archive his or her research in whatever way is most suitable. Then it goes down to blue, which is a little bit less permissive, um, yellow, less still, and white, which is what you want to avoid, which means the journal does not permit you to mount your article anywhere, not on your in your institutional repository or in your own um, personal website. Um, this is an example of what um, a Sherpa Romeo um, record looks like. This is for Nature magazine. You can see that it's considered a yellow journal and it gives you all of the information that you can um, obtain on the restrictions for nature. It includes uh, a six-month embargo, um, 
authors can archive their own um, copy of the paper, but not the PDF version that appears in on the website. Um, and then there are places where preprints and postprints can be archived. And I'm being asked to turn on my camera, so I'm going to see if I can do it now, because I'm not sure how to do it. Start video. Let's see what happens. Um, yes, I'm here. This is my office, and if you're lucky, you'll see my cat. Okay. Now, there are additional ways to um, ascertain um, if a publisher is reputable. Um, and Tony mentioned impact factors just now. Um, one thing that I have, wait, did we do this, Tony? Oh, no. Um, one thing that I have to say is that impact factors are increasingly controversial, particularly for journals that have a regional focus in the global south, because the articles in those journals are not as universally um, of relevance to scientists in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere in the developed world. So um, there are currently ways to see whether journals can be um, evaluated that do not include the impact factor. If you're interested in knowing more about impact factors and interested in knowing um, whether a journal has a high impact factor, you can go to Scopus, which ascertains impact of Elsevier journals, but only Elsevier journals. Google Scholar has a free impact factor service. And what's good about Google Scholar, too, is it will ascertain the impact not just of journal articles, but also on um, case studies, reports, and other kinds of scholarly materials. The web of science is another important um, way to ascertain impact, but um, you must have a subscription to the web of science in order to use it. And the other thing is, if an open access journal is relatively new, you can evaluate the publisher by checking the indicators for their other journals. Okay, everyone knows about journals that are open access journals that are not reputable. They're, they're called predatory journals. They make their money by charging a high publication fee and um, the author has to pay it very quickly. They publish many poor quality papers in what we call shell journals. They, the journals have few staff, the um, articles are not copy edited and they're not um, peer reviewed. Minimal or no peer review. And there are hundreds of these journals covering every academic area. If the journal in which you're interested is not indexed in the directory of online journals, it may very well be a predatory journal and keep away from it. The United States Federal Trade Commission has sued and won a case against Omics International. It's a publisher in India, and it's probably the largest publisher of, um, the Times calls it, questionable scientific journals. And there was a $50 million judgment um, against Omics. I doubt very much that anyone will collect this money. What is the intersection between open educational resources and open access? And Neil talked to us about OER last week. The first thing is that open access research can help educators prepare um, their lessons. The resources will be up to date and the resources will be relevant as opposed to some of the learning materials they may have used in the past. 
OA resources can be used as supplemental or recommended reading for students. Um, this means that lecturers don't have to recommend an expensive and elderly textbook. They can recommend a resource about situations in Africa that would be far more pertinent to the students. Third, and this is the one that I actually like the best, if an educator assigns a student to search online for relevant open access resources, that means the students get better information retrieval skills and it will be learner-centered study. And this is an area for which librarians have a particular role because it's frequently the librarian who is responsible um, to train students and staff on information retrieval skills. Okay, what about African institutional repositories? Um, we all know that repositories can make African research more visible. Um, I've been doing some searching of repositories and for Africa-wide, I've found um, repositories at the African Capacity Building Foundation. Um, and then there's AFRIC Archive, um, which is preprints, primarily in the physical sciences. The Association of African Universities has a, an excellent um, database, uh, full text database of dissertations and research completed at African universities. OER Africa has a repository of resources on OER. The Regional um, Forum for Agriculture, Roof Forum, has a repository of articles and um, dissertations and theses in the agricultural sciences in its member universities. And the UN Economic Commission for Africa has a marvelous repository as well. These are all great resources. I found, and these are major resources, um, university repositories in Botswana, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, Nigeria, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. I would very much like to hear from you all if there are other countries um, for which I haven't uh, that I haven't listed. And I am creating um, a full annotated list, which I'll be able to send you all in a few weeks. Notice that there is only one Arabic speaking country, Sudan. And there is, there are, well, Senegal is the only officially French speaking country. Rwanda is now both French and English. Um, the French-speaking countries are laggards in all of this, and it's something I'm very sorry to have to say. Policies. Some African universities have OER, open access, or repository policies, but unfortunately not many of them do. Every African um, university should integrate OER, open access, and repositories into its IPR policy. And thirdly, Africans, um, we need leadership and champions to implement policies. I've seen many instances where there's an excellent policy, but very little implementation to follow. And here, um, I've uh, given you a quote from the University of Namibia scholarly communications policy. You'll all have these um, the PowerPoint presentation at the end of um, uh, our webinar. And you'll note that we've included links to all of the resources that we've recommended on our slides. So I'm not going to read um, the University of Namibia's policy. Um, I would encourage you to read the whole thing. The AAU, um, the Secretary General of the AAU in December 2018, made a statement um, in support of open access. His statement included um, recommendations on hiring, promotion, and tenure, um, on um, copyright, on um, encouraging and requiring faculty to um, use their institutional archives. 
He went on to discuss the importance of theses and dissertations in institutional archives. Um, he mentioned that all conferences should have open access to presentations within the university archive. And he recommends that all journals that are hosted or published at African universities should be open access or take steps to be friendlier to open access. And this is where you can get the full statement. I encourage everyone to um, think about working with AAU on open access because of its strong interest in the subject. Repository management, and this is what where it becomes very important for librarians. DSpace, we know, is the um, standard platform. Um, some African libraries provide licensing information, but not every repository does. Several organizations offer training in repository management. Um, these have included the AAU and IFL, and I think several of you will be familiar with um, the work of IFL. Okay, now we get to the important topic. Um, what does open access have to do with librarians? Librarians understand the ramifications of how much journals cost. You understand um, how you can help researchers identify high quality journals, and you can help users find um, relevant open access resources. And finally, um, and not least, you manage the institutional repositories um, in which all these resources sit. And you can be champions. You can be champions of open access within your community. You can be champions of policy formula, formulation and implementation. You can promote information retrieval skills. And you can be advocates um, for open access in national and regional organizations. And that's the end of our present. Ah, one more thing. AFLIA can be an, a champion as well, because AFLIA is the organization of librarians in Africa. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much to our presenters and also saving us some time for the Q&A session. Um, personally, I must say this has been a great presentation or great presentations. Uh, there is a lot that you've reminded me about that I'd actually forgotten or taken for granted. Um, my question to start the Q&A goes to Tony. Um, Tony, I'm wondering, you talked about hybrid journals for a fee. Does it mean that the quality, uh, once you pay money, the quality is more than the ones where you don't pay anything. Um, maybe I will also bring other three questions that are outstanding to you and you address three, three questions in a row. Please, um, and no. I Please can I suggest we do them one at a time because I'm, <laughs> I'm going to forget the other ones. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so you want um, to take my class. Good, great. I would prefer just to take one at a time. Um, I just want to say that I took the liberty while Liz was speaking of, um, of answering some of the Q&A questions on the system, uh, and I've answered 11 of them. Um, Liz can still add to those, I think. Um, yes. There are still 10 open questions on there. But to just answer your question, Dr. Sarah, um, uh, you're saying, are they going to be higher quality? No. I would say the, the idea of a hybrid journal is that um, most hybrid journals um, have developed for, from uh, traditional uh, journals that you pay a fee for. Uh, okay. I, I'm being asked to put the presentation screen up. Um, I can do that. But... Um, Okay, and now I'm being asked to enable my camera. So let me put my camera on. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, most of these 
um, hybrid journals start as, as traditional journals, they, they are high quality anyway. They, um, they would say that they have a high, I mean, many of them do, but not all, but many of them have high impact factor and they, uh, they get good reviewers, as good as they possibly can get. All the idea of the hybrid is, is that the publishers then, that publisher of that journal is responding to researchers who would A, like to keep copyright, and B, uh, say that their, um, their publication is open access and anybody can access it without a fee. So I think it's really from that point of view, rather than uh, that they are better or, or, or not as good as, as, as um, the traditional journals. I think that would be my answer. But I mean, Liz is welcome to, to uh, respond as well. Right. Um, I'd like to, the reason that the commercial journals have decided to allow um, authors to publish at, in an open access format in their journal is because they've been forced to do so um, by the donors. If it were not for the donors, they would um, not do it themselves. Um, and so that's really important to remember. The other thing is mm -hmm. that the donors are increasingly requiring their grantees to publish in fully ac open access journals. It started with the Gates Foundation and the entire EU expects to um, start a completely open access environment by 2020. This is causing great consternation in the commercial journal publisher community, um, but it's probably going to happen. So that what I would suspect is within the next couple of years, there won't be any hybrid journals and, there, and the whole commercial publishing industry is going to have to be re, reconfigured because the donors are requiring that um, they not have to pay uh, subscriptions to journals and that authors must be able to make their um, research publicly accessible. Um, it's going to be really interesting to track over the next couple of years. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, Tony, you wanted to take on a question by question. There was a question on the role of a 21st academic library in promoting open access publishing. Is it one of the questions you've already responded to or you wish to take it on? No, um, I've responded to the ones I can respond to. And one or two yeah. of them, I am not uh, don't feel quite competent to respond to. And I'm wondering if, if Liz could do that. Um, so that particular first one, what is the role of 21st academic libraries, 21st century academic libraries in promoting open access publishing? I mean, it's a fairly general question, but I'm sure Liz has more experience of libraries and librarians than me, so maybe she could try to answer. Okay. Um, librarians um, are no longer gatekeepers. Um, researchers and students don't come to a librarian and ask for a book anymore, or shouldn't have to anymore. But librarians are increasingly important because librarians can train users on how to find resources and also um, give them tips on where to go. Kirsty is going to be speaking more um, in two weeks about the intersection um, between librarians and, and um, open, open learning. And so she'll have some ideas on the kinds of training that would help and also on where to look for resources. Um, I've always been a really strong proponent of um, 
including training, information retrieval skills in as part of um, research management courses, because that's where students learn to conduct research and they need to know how to um, carry out an intelligent um, uh, search using the correct keywords and going to the correct resources. I hope I've answered the question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, another question was on the clarification on who a traditional publisher is. Traditional publishers are organizations like Elsevier, Cambridge University Press, Oxford University Press, they are the publishers who um, basically sell to consumers. Um, they make their money through sales, through advertising, through organizing conferences, um, and they, um, they're the publishers that librarians know and are dismayed by. The open access publishers are the newer publishers. Um, they are frequently um, learned societies, but not always. Um, and they are in business to make resources available. Um, and they want to do it at the lowest cost pro possible that is also consonant with quality. Um, I should also add that many open access publishers have gotten startup funding by donors. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the other question is uh, was on the French versions of the slides. Uh, this we, we shall take it up with the up with Aflia, and then we shall come back to you at the right time. Uh, the other question is, which of the three licensing categories deals with the embargo? I think that came out of uh, Tony's presentation. But whoever can take it on, it's okay. I, um, I would actually like, um, if possible, Liz to answer that. Um, I, although I did go through the three, so I'm trying to enable, oh, start video. Um, okay, the host has stopped my video again, so it won't, won't let me go. Um, uh, the question, Liz, is which of the three licensing categories deals with the embargo? Right. Articles that are made open access only after a set period of time. And that was a question from uh, Fred Haybor. I, I don't feel quite competent to answer that. I don't know if you can help. Yeah, you know, the, the embargo... Um actually started at the demand of the um, National Institutes of Health in the United States and also some of uh, the government and donor agencies um, in Europe and elsewhere in the world. They demanded that within 12 months, researchers must be able to post the research that has, was funded by these public agencies on, um, online for, to make it freely accessible. So they said within 12 months. Um, these agencies did not say that it had to be open access. They said freely accessible, and that's a little bit different than open access is. Um, so the embargo started because the journals slowly began to make the, the issues of their journals freely available first after 12 months and sometimes after six months. So that means that for a certain period of time, you must be a subscriber or pay a fee to access an article. After that embargo period, you have um, free access. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, another question is on becoming a member of the Open Access Publishers Association. I think Tony's- I, I, I answered that. I actually just said 
to the to the question the person who put the question i would suggest just going on to their website because then we in our presentation we've provided a link to their website and uh when you everybody can get this presentation uh uh for themselves uh from i think from the administrators at aflia and go to the website and i'm sure there's details there about um about um joining uh, liz i don't know if you want to add no i i i think that's i have nothing else okay thank you um the other question is on checking the genuineness of the open access journals what can guide someone in determining which open access journal is the best or suitable for their researches academic work and the like you have to you have to um, do do some checking. Go to the journal, see whether the articles are relevant to your interest, whether they appear to be um, well written, well copy edited. Um, if you go to the directory of open access journals, there is a, there are lists there. You can do a search on country, and you can also do a search um, on discipline. So um, I would recommend that you do both. Go to the journal, um, go to DOAJ, talk with your colleagues, talk to your supervisor, um, go to the disciplinary databases. Um, there, there are several in ag economics, there are several um, in various other so in social science disciplines and so forth. Um, I see that someone asked a question about Beale's list, and um, Tony answered it partially. Beale is a, a U.S. librarian who started to keep a list on predatory journals. Um, in fact, he was the one who coined the phrase predatory journal. Um, and he also has created some excellent guidelines on how to ascertain whether a journal is legitimate or not. Neil is problematic though. First of all, he's not updating the list anymore. Secondly, he increasingly became, I would have to say prejudiced against um, journals coming from the global South. He particularly had it in for journals from Nigeria and also from India. So there was a good deal of criticism of Beale because of what people perceived to be his innate prejudices against um, journals from the developing world. Um, I'm writing a paper now on open access, which is in its final stages um, of review. Once it's completed, it's going to be available to Aflia and anyone who attended this or, or the other sessions. And I have a lot of information in there and links to um, articles about Beale and also a link to the criteria he used to ascertain uh, the validity of journals. And I think his criteria were excellent. All right. Um, it looks like participants are also interested in making some money. There is a question here on how to make money through subscriptions and advertising uh, with open access. Liz, there you go. Liz, that one's okay. for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be quite frank, um, Open access journals aren't in the business of making money. Um, the only way I think that you could possibly make money, or at least recover your costs, is if in addition to your excellent open access journal in whatever discipline um, you choose to work, you also organize conferences and um, publish um, monographs and um, have supplementary activities that are related to, but different from the journal 
the open access journal that you're publishing. All right, great. Um, the other question to you guys is that, how do open access journals get measured against the impact factor? I know Tony did mention something about it, but you could summarize it. That's a real, I, 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 that is a real problem. And in the paper I'm writing, I started to look at um, the impact factor metrics for um, open and closed journals from the same publisher. And open access journals do not, for the most part, do not have the same impact factor um, I mentioned the fact that um, journal, regional journals um, are not going to have the same impact factor because not as many researchers would be interested in malaria in a, in a, in a location in Uganda or Kenya or um, dengue fever in Nigeria. Um, those are the facts of life. Those articles are exceedingly relevant within the research communities in Africa, but they may not be relevant, equally relevant in the United States or elsewhere. And in my paper, I used an example from The Lancet, which is one of the most highly cited medical journals um, in the world as compared to the Lancet Global, which is open access, but focuses on the, um, on authors and research in the less developed nations and middle income countries. And the um, impact factor at, for the Lancet is about twice as high as the impact for the Lancet Global. And that's why I think it's so important to begin to look at how we can drive a different kind of metric to determine excellence and relevance. Okay, uh, another question to you guys is that why do researchers decide, decide to publish in predatory journals? And who approves or registers such journals? Um, researchers do it because they don't know any better, because they're told that they have to publish. They don't know where to go to publish. And so they find a journal that's going to accept their article or the journal recruits them for an article and, and they do it. And this is one reason why librarians are so important because by rights, and I think it's mainly the students who have um, the propensity to, to publish in predatory journals more than faculty members, but they should be going to their librarian, to their supervisor. They should be getting assistance from, from knowledgeable people on where to publish. I'd like to add to that. Um, I, I did answer this on, I think, uh, by typing, but um, Liz is absolutely right. Um, as academics, academic staff get hundreds of emails from these predatory journals that are asking them to publish in them. They should just put those all in the junk mailbox and ignore them. They also probably get invitations to conferences, some of which don't exist and others they find if they go, when they get there, there's not much going on and they've paid a lot of money. So uh, these unsolicited uh, requests by email to publish in journals are normally from predatory journals. And students, uh, graduate students are especially pr uh, prone to getting these and they, that, that's where Liz is right. You, 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 this is where the librarians are so important to be able to provide uh, information about such journals and warnings in a way to the academic staff and students. Um, there's another pub, uh, a presentation I gave uh, 
a couple of months, a few months back, I, um, I actually started the presentation with two of these emails that were sent to me as examples. And they had my name in because they'd, they'd found something I'd published in a journal. And now they're saying, now, won't you want to publish in my journal? Well, no. The academics, academic staff, researchers, should search out their own journals and they should get advice from librarians uh, in, in doing so. And that's one of the reasons we're talking to you guys today. Okay, um, there, is, there is another question. Uh, Agile, Zenodo, and DAOJ be considered open access? DOAJ is definitely open access. Within Agile, African Journals Online, most of the journals are open access, but I think not all of them are. The, the articles are freely accessible. I have to caution you about Agile, though, because Agile includes journals that are no longer publishing. If you go to some of the journals, you will find that the last update was two or three years ago. I think that the organization is planning to clean up its list, but the last time I looked, which was a few weeks ago, it was still, um, I was still finding journals that um, were, did not appear to be active. So I think that DOAJ is, is a far more reliable um, way of finding open access, unfortunately. Okay, uh, another question for you is that why, the, why repositories make African research more visible in the global knowledge pool? What a question. Because African repositories are in several reasons. For one reason is African repositories are routine routinely indexed in Google Scholar, which has become the default mechanism for um, doing a literature review. It's free, it tells you how many times um, a resource has been cited and by where, and how to obtain the resource. Um, because you are using DSpace, Google Scholar automatically picks it up. Um, so that's one reason. The the, it's the visibility more than anything else. Up until maybe 10 years ago, it was virtually impossible to find African research on the internet. I may be exaggerating, maybe 15 years ago. Um, and I know because it's, it's an area on which I was working. Now, because of repositories and other mechanisms, it's far easier to find the research. It's far easier to ascertain whether there has been any plagiarism, which was not widely discussed today. Um, and it just makes Africa more visible. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for that, uh, for that response. Another question to you to take is what kind of strategies can we use to convince researchers and the students to make their publications open? Well, I think you need to talk first with your university leadership and get them on board, um, as the AAU suggests. And perhaps it would be good to think about a, a collaborative um, strategy with the AAU because all of the African universities at the vice chancellor and leadership level, um, they're all members of the AAU and the secretary general has spoken out very forcefully um, on behalf of the AAU in favor of um, open access. And then you just have to go and start lobbying um, with um, the faculties that are responsible for collecting 
theses and dissertations. In some universities, um, I read that the University of Joss, for example, requires that all students um, place a copy of um, his or her thesis or dissertation within the university repository. This was a presentation by Stephen Akintunde at a meeting um, several months ago. Um, but it takes a lot of effort. And that's why um, I th think that it's important for the librarians, for FLIA and other organizations to work um, in collaboration on this. Okay. Um, another question is, how can librarians actively get to engage policymakers to support open access movement and make it successful? Liz? Sorry, I'm, uh, I, yeah, I've let, let Liz answer that. Um, yeah. Um, I think that when, if you're talking about policymakers within your institution, I think librarians know how to try to do that. Um, but it would be good to try to bring on board um, members of the teaching staff as well. Um, I, many years ago, ran a project, um, and now you're going going to know how old I am on CD-ROM and using CD-ROM research databases. And we always had librarians and faculty members working together on the project. Um, if you're talking about at a higher level within governments, then I think it needs to be a FLIA and, and it needs to be the AAU because I'm not sure that librarians have an, as individuals have an entree into those bodies. I could be wrong. Okay, thank you. How can we acquire open education resources? That is another question for you. Tony. Um, I actually, actually, I just responded to that one on, on, online. Um, I, because it's open education resources, I actually suggested that the the question uh, uh, refers to last fortnight's presentation, the last AFLIA webinar by um, Neil Butcher, because that's exactly what it was covering. It was covering open educational resources. Um, so I'm assuming AFLIA is making these um, available to its membership, so that the person who asked that question should really refer to last week, last time's uh, webinar, and they will have the answers, I think, in that. Great. Um, the last question that we, uh, I'm hoping to take on is, are there significant differences between open access journals with APC and open access journals with APC? Without APC. I think the difference difference between open access journals with APC and open access journals without APC. Liz, do you know the answer to that? You know, I don't, but I, we could look it up. Um, it's the Audited Bureau of Circulation. And do they even audit online? I know they audit print. Are you looking it up, Tony? No, I'm not. I'm just responding in writing to it. But uh, if we don't know now, I think we ought to uh, maybe uh, maybe say we don't know the answer. Uh, I think what we could do is to look it up and then send feedback to the participants. Um, yes. We are coming to the end of the presentations and I'm asking Tony and Liz, to start to wrap up in two minutes your presentation parts. Tony, would you like to start? <laughs> Muted my microphone, sorry. Um, yes, uh, well, mine was really just the introduction to the idea of, of uh, open access, um, really just explaining what open access journals are how they differ from traditional subscription-based journals, and um, how there are some journals now 
that are hybrid between the two. And then I went on to stress that uh, you need to, you, librarians need really to, uh, I think, create their own databases of high quality open access journals so that when academic staff ask them about them, they can say, these are good journals. Now, I think that AFLIA can assist with that because obviously we don't want every librarian creating their own data database but if AFLIA could help to uh, share um, when uh, when we have a when there are lists of uh, probably sorted by discipline um, lists of um, high quality open access journals and those could be shared in some form by by AFLIA because that is what I see as the role of librarians to assist the academic staff to be able to publish in in open access journals that are reasonably high quality Thank you. Uh, thank you. Liz, could you wrap up in two minutes, please? Sure. Um, I think that there are important roles for AFLIA, and, and I've been thinking of a few, but as we talk about repositories, what I have found is that all of the online organizations that um, give information about repositories at African universities and research institutions. Every single one of them is out of date. Um, sometimes the URLs don't work. Um, sometimes um, there's, they don't have the name of some of the important repositories. I think that AFLIA could have a really important role in tracking where African repositories are and perhaps updating a list, an online list every six months or so, um, because it's just not available. Um, I think that there are other information gathering activities that you could consider. Another thing that's been, I've been thinking about, and I think it may come up in Kirsty's presentation um, in two weeks, on um, everything that we're suggesting that librarians do costs money. It requires a body in the librarian to, to do these things. And I'm wondering whether there shouldn't be more information available about what are the cost factors that go into ensuring that li libraries can carry out their responsibilities in terms of open, making information available on open access and OERs. Not to cost it out, but at least to know the, 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 the data points of what needs to go into um, a work plan in terms of bodies and technology. All right, thank you so much. Uh, to our dear participants, um, I have two announcements for you. One, we are encouraging all libraries and information institutions and associations uh, to join AFLIA by paying membership to AFLIA. And we will remember AFLIA is the continental voice of all of us librarians on the African continent. And you can also join as a friend to AFLIA. Uh, two, uh, the AFLIA is going to conduct a conference that the third AFLIA conference and the fifth African Library Summit Nairobi, Kenya, uh, during the period 19th to 24th May, 2019. And I'm happy to inform you that one of our presenters on open education resources, uh, Mr. Neil Butcher, is going to, is the keynote speaker. Uh, so we, we look forward to the keynote address. Uh, for those of you who missed the first uh, presentation on open education resources, Neil Butcher is based in South Africa. And he has provided policy and technical advice and support to a range of national and international clients in educational planning, use of and use of education technology, 
and distance education. He has also worked with various education institutions, assisting transformation uh, efforts and managing numerous projects that focus on effectively unnecessing the potential of distance education methods, education technology, and what is of interest to us, open education resources. I wish to say thank you so much uh, to taking part in these webinars, AFRIA's webinars, and we are looking forward to seeing you in Nairobi. Uh, to our presenters, the participants are saying thank you so much. They have enjoyed the presentations. I hand over.